Um, good afternoon. Um, good morning. I know we have people from different time zones and different places across the United States, which is really exciting. Um, as Jordan said, my name is Isaac. I use the pronouns he, him, his, or they, them, theirs. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to get to have this conversation with you all today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. All right. So um, switch this real quick. Y'all get to watch me struggle while I grab the task bar here. All right, excellent. So um, great. You, you would think that by now after most of the year, we kind of gotten used to being in this Zoom world, but I, I think that we're still all getting used to it. Um, so I really appreciate that everyone is here today and that this really drew such a big audience. Um, so today I'm, I'm gonna be focusing on affirming care for trans and non-binary clients. Of course, that's going to include some discussion about the LGBTQ community as a whole, um, but really focusing on this population as, I, uh, as I've done education, I tend to get more questions about this community specifically. So I'm really glad that you all are, are just as interested. I also wanna say that throughout today's presentation, I'm representing my own views, so I'm not representing ASU or my program or, or the, pl the place that I work, um, but, but my information is informed by my own experiences as a trans queer social worker, as well as my experiences in the community and um, through research and, and evidence-based practices and things like that. So I, um, I appreciate Jordan sharing my bio at the beginning, but I, I will still say that I'm only an expert in my own experience, right? I can't speak for the whole community, but I can share what I, what I know and I can talk in sort of general general terms today that in a way that will help you to continue to build your skills to get more information for your clients. Um, so throughout, uh, we're going to be definitely taking questions. I'll have time for questions at the end as well. Um, and hopefully this is information that is useful for you all. So um, for today, going to be, um, sorry, just moving the chat out of the, out of the way here. So today we're gonna to be reviewing appropriate terminology. That was a big question. Um, thank you all that, for everyone that filled out the survey ahead of time. That really allowed me to know what the group was interested in knowing. We're also gonna discuss strengths, unique concerns and challenges for trans populations, for non-binary populations. Briefly cover some information around transition, um, discuss affirming methods for building therapeutic al alliance, and then also share resources for referrals, continuing education and advocacy. Um, I did see a question real quick in the chat and I think it's a good time to share too. I won't be sharing this whole slide deck in, in totality. Um, this information changes quickly and it can be pretty, uh, it, can, it can just move really fast. And so I, I'm, instead of providing this PowerPoint where things can change, I provided a list of all the resources that I've used so that you can continue to get the information directly from the sources. So half of the resource sheet is going to be from Arizona specifically. So apologize for those that are out outside of Arizona, but the other half is national resources and continuing education information. So don't worry, don't try to scribble and write everything down. You will have the resources, um, but let me know if I need to go back and cover anything again. So just thinking about some norms for today, um, I would just ask everyone to keep an open mind. And I think if you're here, um, that's something that you're already used to doing or, or that you're striving to do. Um, but when I say that, I really mean also just kind of reflecting on your own experiences and then thinking about how to integrate the information that we're receiving today and to breathe through any kind of discomfort or um, challenges with new information. Sometimes when I do these presentations, um, and I think it's just a natural kind of a kind of way of, of, of connecting. We also sort of shut down and we think, I'm never gonna get this right. We get really concerned about doing everything perfectly or I'm never gonna remember all of the terms. And sometimes that comes from a place of being um, just, just concerned that we're gonna mess up and we're gonna hurt someone's feelings. There is a chance you're gonna mess up. We all make mistakes. Um, we all integrate new information in different ways. And so just recognizing that, um, reflecting on your own experiences and kind of moving through it and trusting the process. And this also won't be your last opportunity to learn. This is a one, one and a half hour workshop on a very big topic. Um, and any, any of these topics we could absolutely break down and have longer discussions about. So at the end of my presentation, I provide my contact information. So if you have questions, you wanna even like staff or consult on a case, or if you want more training for you or your organization, you can absolutely reach out and let me know. So this is just gonna like 
get us all centered on some, some basic information today. And then of course, take care of yourselves. Um, some of this information, we're not gonna get into anything too heavy, but I also recognize that if, if you're part of the community or you have someone that is close to you in the community, um, it can be tough to hear some of these things and just a reminder of sort of the environment that we're in. Um, and a norm I don't have up here um, is just having having grace for one another and, and ourselves. So um, again, just, just being gentle and kind with yourself as you take in new information and also, uh, Grace, a little grace for me as we have work from home challenges. I have two cats and a dog and they tend to really like to, to speak up when they hear me on Zoom. And typically I would mute myself, but obviously I, I can't do that or you wouldn't be able to hear me. So I apologize for the, the meows or the barks you might hear in the background, but I have a feeling that some of you might be able to relate just with work from home challenges. And then uh, one, one sort of final norm um, and I don't know if, if my mentor and colleague Shane actually uh, said this or borrowed this from someone, so I don't know who to credit, but I'm crediting Shane today. Um, we might have heard of the golden rule, which is to treat, how, uh, treat others how you want to be treated. And so I'd like to present the platinum rule, which is to treat others how they want to be treated. And so this is to say, again, um, rolling with the discomfort, we might get new information, we might feel not sure about how to say something or how to how to honor someone's experience. So just thinking about what is that person sitting in front of us asking for? How would they like us to engage with them and treat them and mirror that experience? So it, and I think this also provides a little bit of, of room for us to continue growing and learning while having compassion for those that we're working with. All right, <laughs> seeing, seeing some tears for the fur ball, so maybe they'll make, make their way in here. So I really appreciate everyone that shared um, in, the, in the survey that I sent out beforehand. I wanted to get kind of a sense of where everyone was as much as possible. And I, so I really appreciate all the responses. About 50 people responded. And so I just want to share that it, um, it looks like most folks have the most confidence in working with lesbian, gay, bisexual, and queer clients or others that have uh, sexualities that are not heterosexual. Um, so most of that was in the three, four, and five for the very confident, whereas people were less confident working with trans and non-binary folks. So I share this as a way to no just normalize everyone's experiences that um, healthcare providers, so social and human service providers, people working in schools, we're all kind of catching up to the experiences of trans and non-binary folks. Um, so I think that this presentation is and, and work like this is really important. So I appreciate Aurora um, creating this space and I thank them for welcoming me in to, to provide this education today. And then kind of similarly, I, I asked, um, are you currently working with or have you ever worked with LGBTQ clients in the past? And a majority of people said that they definitely had worked with LGBTQ clients. Um, a couple people said that they were uncertain or said, oh, here are some I wasn't sure if uh, Jordan was. Nope. Okay. Just got him. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure if you were trying to get my attention. Deep muted. <laughs> um, so most of you had said yes. A couple of you had said no, and some of you were uncertain. And even it might possibly be that for those of you that said no, maybe you just didn't know, um, or maybe you, or maybe you haven't. And so that's part of the conversation today too. Whereas let people were less certain if they had worked with trans and non-binary clients. Um, or they more people had said no, or they or they weren't sure. So that's also interesting um, as well, and kind of goes along exactly with why we're having this presentation today. So if there's things that you don't know, that's okay. That's why we're here. Um, if some of this information is really basic for you, I apologize, but hopefully there's something that you can walk away with today, or new information, or even just a new way of presenting something that you're already pretty comfortable with. Well, so the first place that we're going to begin is just with some terminology. A lot of you had asked, um, how do I know what terms to use? What's offensive? What's not offensive? What is the best way to ask about terms? And so, you know, right at the beginning, I've already shared my gender pronouns. And so we'll talk about how to ask those and why those are important and cover terminology that's mostly about gender and sexuality. Now, I will say I'm not going to go into every single term because we would be here like literally all day. I just want to provide some, some basics. Um, but it, in the resource sheet, there is a link to more terms, and I've shared a link um, with, with Cassie. I think it might have gone through, so maybe sharing in the chat, but if not, it's okay um, to not know every single term, because even if I define that term for you today, the person that you're working with might have a very different way of defining that same exact term. So that's another reason for not going through 
uh, all of the terms and expecting you to memorize them. But before I get into specific terminology, I want to start with the gender binary. So if we were kind of in person, I would ask you, what have you heard about the gender binary and what comes to mind? Um, and typically people say blue and pink. And I ask what kind of toys for boys and the trucks, cars, things like that. What about girls, dolls? Um, and this, I would get the same answer if I presented this in a school or at a healthcare organization or at a youth center. And it wasn't because we all got the same education in the same place, but that because those norms are so embedded into our society that it's just kind of a given. We've seen gender reveal parties. Um, we kind of know and expect what kind of colors things might be um, for boys and girls, things like that. So this, this all leads back to the gender binary. And so when I talk about the binary, this is what I'm gonna be talking about today. So I don't know if, if anyone has ever played the game of life. Um, you get your little car and then you get your little pegs and the women and the girls are pink and the boys and the men are blue. So there's an assumption that once you're born, you'll be assigned one of two sexes at birth, either male or female, right? And it will be based on anatomy. The doctor takes a look and says, um, you're male or female, and those are the two options. And, and even for babies who are born intersex, which we'll get to later, um, we still kind of force them into one box, male or female. So there's an expectation then, um, as you get older, if you were assigned male at birth, your gender is gonna be a boy. If you were assigned female at birth, then your gender is gonna be a girl. And so you can also put yourself into one of these cars if you want and go, go along for the ride, but also think about your own journey anyway. Think, okay, my birth certificate, how was I assigned at birth? And then does that line up for me? So that expectation is that it would. The assumption then is that you might, then if you're a male, you would express yourself in stereotypically masculine ways or feminine ways. And I, I know this isn't true for everyone. So just thinking about like the societal expectation, right? Um, and then you would be expected to be attracted to someone of the opposite, opposite sex or gender. Um, you would be assumed that once you get into a relationship, you're going to be in a monogamous relationship. You're going to settle down with one man or one woman. Um, it's going to be a, a relationship that involves sexual uh, sexuality and emotions and physical attraction and things like that. Um, that there's a very specific way to connecting to your partner. And that the goal then is marriage, the so 2.5 kids, the white picket fence, the dog, the two-car garage, the, the whole thing, right? And if you've if you achieved that, you've you've won the, the assumed binary roadmap. And if this is your path, that's awesome. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. That's fantastic. Um, if it's not your path, I share this because there are consequences for veering off of this path at any, at any place. So if you express a gender that was different than your assigned sex at birth, if you express a gender expression differently, um, if your attraction doesn't line up to only one of two genders and it's the opposite gender, there's real consequences for that. And I think that's where a lot of the challenges that LGBTQ people face come from is the assumption that, that everyone is gonna follow this path. And if you don't, um, there's something wrong with your car, you're on the wrong path and um, people might wanna try to change that path. And so that assumption is called heteronormativity where people are going to assume that you're heterosexual or that you should be heterosexual um, or straight. That's another, um, another word for heterosexual as well as cis normativity, which means we assume that you're not gonna be transgender. So cisgender means not transgender. So we assume that you're gonna fall into these boxes um, and, and that you're gonna take this path. And so when I talk about assumptions today, when we talk about consequences for breaking out of these assumptions, it comes back to one very specific perspective. And we know this is really steeped in a Western cultural ideology. So I'm also gonna be sharing terms that, that might not relate to folks from around the world or from different time periods, but this is like very much Western ideology. And we see people are, are veering from this path, but there are still consequences even today. Having said that, we do know that sexuality is much more complicated than that. And everyone has a sexuality. Um, we tend to only think about sexuality when we think about people who are not heterosexual or not straight. Um, but really we all have we all have one so again personalize this to yourself where do you fall how do you identify and sexuality is comprised of emotional romantic physical spiritual sexual attraction or connection or an absence of any or one of or all of those feelings towards others um, and we also know that behavior doesn't 
equal identity. So someone might engage in sex with someone of the same sex and not um, describe themselves as gay, um, or they might bump labels all together and say, I don't wanna use any labels for myself, um, or someone might use the word bisexual, um, someone else might use the word pansexual. So it's going to be really different for each person, but essentially it's how we connect to one another. Conversely then is gender. So I, I present these two terms because sometimes people mix up and conflate sex and gender, uh, or sorry, sexuality and gender. Um, so sexuality is about who you love and how you love. Sex, gender is about who you are. Um, and it's, it's hard to describe gender without using terms in the definition, um, but sex and gender refers to physiological, expressive, behavioral characteristics that we typically would assign just to two binary categories. Um, you might've heard people say before, sex is what's between your legs and gender is what's between your ears. Um, then there's been some, some pushback and I think it's maybe too complicated for today's conversation. Um, so just know that even this definition and how we're, how we're talking about sex and gender changes, but essentially it's, it's who you are as a man, a woman, non-binary, gender queer. So it's about who, who you are as a person, whereas sexuality again is about who you love. So the term that I'm gonna be using today is mostly going to be gender and sex assigned at birth. And sex assigned at birth is just the, again, going back to that, that roadmap, when you were born, the doctor made a decision, you're either male or female, that those were previously the only two options on birth certificates. Um, and we're gonna base that on body parts. We're not gonna wait for you to tell us. We're just gonna assume if you have a penis, you're a boy, if you have a vagina, you're a girl. And that's, that's the end of the conversation, right? So that's sex assigned at birth. And, and we know still, even though we have kind of these rigid boxes, that there are tons of sexualities and tons of genders, or maybe I shouldn't say we know, but um, that, that because that might not be a given fact um, for, for everyone's knowledge, but there, there are, uh, sexuality and gender is so vast and so diverse. And so I wanna share some terms from the Trevor Project, um, which is an LGBTQ youth serving organization and, and crisis line. They recently did a mental health survey and they gave space for youth to write in their sexuality and to write in their gender. And these are some of the sexualities that they shared. So I'm not gonna go through all of them. Um, you'll be provided with terms list, but later if you wanna write one down, you have a question about it. Uh, at the end of the section, I'm happy to, to discuss any of them. But there's a lot more here than just lesbian, gay, bisexual, and straight. Um, so even the acronym LGBTQ is not enough to capture the whole community. Um, so there's there's tons of different ways and, and terms that people use. You will see queer on here. And I know that there are some questions in the survey, which is a, is a common question. Is this a slur? Is this a negative term? I've always associated it with something that's very negative. And for some people, it has been really negative. Um, but this is also been a term that's been reclaimed, especially by younger generations. And so when I go back to that platinum rule about treat others how they want to be treated. It's really important to, if somebody uses that for themselves, then that's okay for you to use for them um, rather than, than not using that term at all. So to give any kind of an example of how that plays out, um, I went to the doctor with someone to be there as a support and the doctor um, was great. They, they had sexual orientation on their, on their form. So they said, are you heterosexual or homosexual? And my friend was like, um, I'm neither, I'm queer. And they were like, okay, is that the same thing as being homosexual? And so it's like, they were almost there. The doctor, you know, they tried, they had sexual orientation on the form and then they still only allowed for like two options. One, and homosexual was like an, an outdated, sometimes offensive term. So they didn't even have the right term, but they didn't have a way to still capture this person's sexuality in totality. So um, as we kind of go throughout, I'll kind of give some tidbits about how to do that better or just kind of pitfalls to avoid. So they, they tried, but they didn't quite get there. So there is a, just a wide diversity of sexuality and it's something to be, um, you know, it doesn't have to be like a negative thing that people kind of shut down and like, oh, I'll never think about all of it, but just to celebrate that humans can be so diverse, I think it's a really beautiful thing. So just as there are many and multiple sexualities, there's also tons of genders outside of 
male and female. And so these are just some of them. So the terms that I'll probably use most often today are gonna be trans man, trans woman, and non-binary, but there are lots of lots of terms. I mentioned cisgender already, which means not transgender. Um, and so we we really kind of get stuck in this either or sort of situation. You're either straight or you're gay, or you're a man or you're a woman, or you're trans or you're not. Um, and a lot of those binaries are really steeped in colonialism and um, white ideals, Western ideals, whereas these genders and sexualities, even though they seem new, diversity has existed throughout all of time and across all cultures. So I'm just gonna put all of them up there together just to kind of, again, um, and if you wanna see this list, I um, you can go to the Trevor Project that'll be in the resources so you can check it out and just see. But this is why it's also hard, like if, we, if I were to sit here and, and discuss all of these, that's all we would get through today. Um, whereas instead you might say, oh, you know, I've never heard the term queer before. How do you define that? You know, is it important for me to know? Or um, you mentioned bisexual. That's this is my understanding of it. How do you relate to this term? So if it's appropriate, if it's clinically necessary, you can also ask the person how they're using it, which is different than, oh my gosh, I don't even know what that word is. Can you please educate me? Like, do you, do you see the difference between those two? I wish I could see your faces to see if like this is, if, you know, if that kind of connected, but it, it really is about how you present the information. Wow, thanks for telling me. I just wanna make sure and check in if I'm, if I'm getting this right. So we can do a little bit of homework to make sure that we know we have a, like a starting point and then we can ask our clients to help supplement from there. Again, if it is necessary. And sometimes depending on why they're there or why we're talking to them, that isn't always necessary to be part of the conversation. Okay, so I know this like this part gets a little bit tedious with all the all the terms, but um, I just want to make sure that we're kind of on the same page. So again, trans or transgender, it, it's a term to describe someone whose gender does not align with the sex they were assigned at birth. So to personalize it, um, mentioned in my bio that I'm trans, so I was assigned female at birth. That didn't really click with me. That's not how I identify. Um, I use the term trans or transgender or transmasculine um, or non-binary. So I, I use he, him, his, or they, them, theirs pronouns. Um, so I, I use this term trans. Um, and then if you think about yourself, think about if you were assigned male or female at birth, does that align with who you are? Are, are you a man or are you a woman? Um, so if, if so, and you, that's how you were assigned at birth, then you might use the term cis or cisgender. I know there has been some pushback around like, why do we need a term for people who are not trans? Or, you know, I've heard like cis or cisgender is offensive or it's a slur, but trans means the other side and cis means the same or the same side. So really it's just a way to have language for everyone and to normalize that everyone has a gender, everyone has a sexuality. Um, and so it's just a way of saying like, instead of, you know, people who are cisgender and normal versus like, people who are transgender and not normal. So it's a way just to have language for everyone. So, um, and I think, you know, that that provides some, maybe some more connection too, that I, this is something that everyone, everyone has a part of them. And then uh, the term intersex, and we'll we won't really talk about intersex folks today. So know that being intersex is not the same thing as being transgender. Although there are some intersex people who identify as transgender, but really it's an umbrella term for differences in sex traits. And this can show up in genitalia and in hormones, internal anatomy, external anatomy. Um, it can be evident at birth. Uh, it can be evident in puberty or later on in life. And it's just a, another way that our bodies um, are amazing and, and can really have so many different, take on different forms. Um, you might've heard the term hermaphrodite previously. So that's a term that you're using. Take that out of your vocabulary and replace it with intersex. So that would really be the term, um, really be the term to use there instead of uh, hermaphrodite. And this definition comes from Interact Advocates, uh, which is a really fantastic organization. If you want more information specifically to or about intersex folks, um, to really get all of that information. Okay, and then this is the last uh, trans or the last um, terminology related slide. So somebody who is a trans girl or a trans woman, 
somebody who was assigned male at birth, but who is a girl or, or who is a woman. So sometimes I hear that uh, flipped. So just think about if you're confused about whether to call someone a trans, a trans girl or a trans boy, what is their current gender, right? So this person is a woman, is a girl. So they might use the term trans girl or trans woman or transgender woman. Um, sometimes people just drop kind of the, the term trans or transgender altogether and don't, don't use that term anymore. Um, but they are still a, a woman or a girl, right? So this might be something that changes, but somebody who was assigned male at birth, but is a girl or a woman. Similarly, or the opposite, a trans boy, trans man, somebody who's assigned female at birth, but is a boy, is a man. Um, so you can think about it again, if the person in front of you is, is a boy, is a man, so you really want to use that language if that's what they use. And then somebody who is non-binary. Non-binary is a, a, both an umbrella and an identity. So some people just use the term non-binary, but it's for somebody who is assigned a sex at birth and then that, that doesn't align with who they are. So kind of the same as um, transgender or trans, but they might use the term gender queer a gender, which means outside of gender altogether, by gender, any of the genders that I haven't listed already. And some folks who are non-binary are trans and some people who are non-binary don't use the term trans. So this is where, again, having a basic understanding of what these terms mean and then checking in with the person in front of you to say, how do you use this? What does this mean to you? The, again, this is my understanding. Am I understanding you correctly? Just so I know a little bit more about you. I wanna make sure that I'm honoring your, your journey. Um, and then the last term that I have on here is two-spirit and somebody who is two-spirit, this is a Native American specific term, um, somebody who embodies both masculine and feminine spirits. Different tribes have unique language to describe somebody who is two-spirit. Uh, today, some people use two-spirit as an umbrella term for LGBTQ and Native, um, whereas someone will use it specifically to describe their gender. So this is also another term that can be used in different ways, but it's really important that this is only specific to Native and Indigenous folks. Um, and this term replaces an old um, colonial term that was pretty offensive. This term came about in the 1990s, but there's also tribe-specific language. And so this also shows that um, gender was has been diverse for a long time, and Two-Spirit folks really held a very revered and sacred place in their tribe, and that was really embedded in part of their culture. But once colonizers came in. We know that so much of Native culture um, was lost through attempted genocide and so much was lost from, um, from who they are. And so as part of that attempt to eradicate um, Native folks and, and culture, that part was lost as well. And so kind of these boxes, we think about where does this come from? Whose norm is this or what dominant culture is this part of? And really understanding that this isn't something that's new. And so um, some tribes have, have become open to to spirit and, and queer and LGBTQ folks again, and others are still kind of working, working towards that equality. Ooh, so <laughs> this is a lot of, a lot of terms, and I'm just kind of like throwing, throwing that stuff at you. Um, so this might be a good place if there were specific questions that anyone had around terminology. So I think we just had a few people kind of questioning the use of the word quote unquote normal, but I think you kind of addressed that with norm and dominant culture. Um, but that's the only thing that's coming so far, but I'm keeping an eye out and if anything else pops up, I will let you know. Awesome. Thank you. So, so I, I appreciate the check on that language, right? And when I say normal, like I would put it in quotes. Um, some people might call that dominant culture, but the, but I think that the reason I use that language specifically is because the what's perceived as the norm is um, being straight, being heterosexual, being cisgender. And so that is um, the dominant culture, right? And that's kind of been the expected norm um, when really we're, we're so much more diverse than that. And so again, this isn't to knock if you fall into um, the cisgender and heterosexual category, we love you too. Uh, and I say that with you know tongue in cheek, but it's, it's not to knock that at, at all by any means but just to show that there is uh, quite a lot of diversity across sexuality and gender, which can be really exciting. So kind of moving on to some of like the how, the how to's. Um, so I, again, at the beginning, I shared my gender pronouns 
And if you've gotten an email from me, you might have seen that my pronouns are in my email. And so this is something that, again, I think people kind of get tripped up and think this is only something that applies to trans people or to non-binary people. But think about yourself again, put this, you know, back on you. Think about, okay, if I were to leave the room, you know, how people just, you know, if they didn't want to use my name, how would they talk about me? So maybe you use she, her, hers. Um, maybe you use he, him, his. Uh, some people also use they, them, their. So I mentioned I use both he, him, and they, them, um, kind of on a trans, masculine, non-binary spectrum. So I'm comfortable using either sets of pronouns. And at the bottom is a, an, an additional set of pronouns, Z, here, hears, or here, self, or Z, zer, zers, and zer, self. So that's another set of pronouns. And typically for folks who are non-binary or fall outside of a male, female um, gender, or um, they might still be male or female, but utilize a different set of pronouns. Some people don't use any pronouns and they only use their name. And so it's just really important to recognize that people are gonna have different ways of, of um, communicating and, and different genders and that might show up differently in pronouns and that's totally fine. Um, do get some pushback um, around they, them, theirs. If that's a plural, you know, that's a plural pronoun. We can't, you know, I can't use that because that's not really correct. Um, I don't know, you know, I can't really use that because then I won't be grammatically correct. But we um, we already use it, even if we don't think about it. I just use it kind of in describing pronouns. So you see like a set of keys on a, a shelf in a store and you're like, oh gosh, I don't know whose keys those are. I better go turn them in, I better go turn the keys in to customer service so that when they come back for them, they'll be able to get their keys, right? So we, we sort of automatically do it. We don't know the gender of the owner of those keys. We're not certainly not saying that multiple people are gonna come back for that one set of keys, probably is what we're saying. So we already kind of use it. It's also been used as a non-plural pronoun throughout time. Um, if it's important to know, Webster added it as, a, as another pronoun in the dictionary. So if you also get kind of any questions or I can't use that, um, I just try to gently show folks that we already absolutely 100% do. Um, sometimes you can also use they, them, theirs if you're not sure what someone's pronouns are until you are able to ask. And then in the next slide, I'm gonna show kind of what that looks like. So you can also download this, uh, this chart from Trans Student Educational Resources. You can have it in your office, you can have it posted somewhere, you can have it as a reference. And so um, you can also use this as a tool when you're asking people about their pronouns if it's something that is new to them. So this, so meet Alex. Um, I was able to um, use this picture from the Gender Spectrum Collection. And on each of the pictures for the Gender Spectrum Collection, they have a, um, a caption that describes the individual. So I assigned the name Alex, um, but this person was described as being a non-binary femme individual. So we don't, you know, here it says their sex was male assigned at birth. That's less important to know, but I'm just sharing it for the purposes of this presentation. And they use they, them, their pronouns. So maybe I'm um, doing intake. I meet Alex for the first time. I say, hi, Alex. Thank you so much for coming in today. My name is Isaac and I use he, him, his, or they, them, theirs pronouns. What pronouns do you use? And Alex might kind of get it right away and, oh, cool, you know, I use they, them, theirs. Alex might also look at me and say, I'm not really sure what you mean because it's not something that we typically have asked everyone, right? We're start starting to get into the, the idea of, of normalizing that. So you might back up a little bit and even before they give you that confused look, you might say, gender pronouns are how I would refer to you if you were in the room. So if I was like, oh, Alex um, is gonna be right back. They will be back later. You know, how, how should I refer to you? Um, so you can explain it that way. That is like a placeholder for your name. It's like a really easy way to place, a gender pronoun is just a placeholder for your name and we all have them. So I wanna make sure that I'm honoring yours. Um, and sometimes you might even go a step further depending on the context or the relationship with your client or your student, because I know that there's a lot of K-12 folks that are joining us. Um, thank you so much. Is it is it okay for me to use these pronouns with others when talking about you, or is that something to keep between you and me? Now, you might not ask that question every single time, um, but again, depending on the context or what that client has shared, like, oh, you know, I'm, I am trans or I am queer, but I'm not really out to a lot of people. 
um, you might want to just check in and see how, when, and where you can use those. So that's just like one example of how to quickly and easily share your pronouns. I've included them in my email with a link that describes what pronouns are. Um, I used to ask everyone to share pronouns at the beginning of a meeting, but I've kind of stopped doing that without providing the education in the background first to avoid further harm or accidentally outing people. So I think it's really good practice to model that. Um, but if you're gonna do that at a meeting, making sure to provide education and say, these are what gender pronouns are. We wanna be able to ask folks because we wanna make sure that we're addressing everyone correctly. Um, but also, you know, giving people a chance to opt out. If you're not comfortable sharing, that's totally okay because we don't want people to feel pressure to out themselves. Um, you certainly don't wanna start doing this once you have like the one trans person show up and then it's really obvious why you're doing it and everyone's really uncomfortable about it. So you, you want to, I don't wanna discourage you from asking, but I just wanna encourage that this is done in a way that's really intentional um, because I've also seen people kind of joke about it like, oh, uh, my pronouns are diva queen king, you know, and so then it kind of makes light of it and it shows that you haven't really thought about this before. It's not really safe for, for me to share because it's just kind of a joke to you. So that you want to kind of avoid that harm as well. So if you have questions about how to integrate this into a meeting, I want to talk about that more later. I'm happy to do that. Um, but just to recap, gender pronouns, just a placeholder for your name. Pause there and uh, check the chat real quick, cool. So, the, so terminology is fluid, it's ever changing. Um, so many people might use terms differently. I might, you know, I use the term queer for myself. I didn't always use that term as I was kind of exploring gender and sexuality. Um, I didn't always use the term trans. I didn't honestly even know what it meant to be trans until I got to college. And, and then my world kind of opened up to new possibilities. So just keeping that in mind that clients might also be at a different place in their journey with the terms that they're using and that might change over time. So we get into some challenges and strengths. Um, I'm gonna provide an overview of different kinds of protective factors and risk factors for specifically for trans and non-binary communities. And that's the main focus of today's discussion. I'm not gonna provide like a lot of statistics because I think that people's eyes like just hearing a bunch of number isn't very helpful. So in the um, resources that I provide, if you are a data nerd like me, because believe me, like I, I'm in a PhD program, I love, I love data, right? Um, but I recognize that it's not everyone's jam and sometimes it's not totally helpful. I will provide those resources so that you do have that information. But in general terms, I want to share these risk factors and protective factors. And this, um, there's been a couple of researchers that have created the gender minority stress and resilience model as a way to kind of capture the challenges that trans and non-binary individuals face. And I'm gonna use trans and non-binary together because again, some folks that are non-binary are trans and some are not, and that this kind of encapsulates the whole community. Um, and and we, we'll see in a couple of slides that trans and non-binary folks might have higher levels of suicidality, of depression, of substance use, of um, anxiety, of fewer opportunities for employment, all sorts of things. And we want to be really careful that we're not pathologizing identity. So to do that, we really need to make sure that we're looking at the factors that are impacting whether or not somebody is supported that can contribute to depression, to anxiety, to suicidality. So in the blue, we see some of the protective factors, community connections, um, connections to other trans individuals, to the LGBTQ community as a whole, to other people in their life, for youth having at least one supportive adult in their life for someone who is trans or non-binary or queer really can make a huge difference in whether or not um, they, they experience more or less depression, anxiety, or suicidality. So you might be that one social worker, that one person on that student's campus. Maybe you're that one provider that gets it. Um, maybe you're that cool aunt or a really supportive parent. That can really make a huge difference in a youth's life. Um, and there's also um, been some studies too and showing that even being able to be a mentor for other people, so trans folks being able to guide others in their transition has also been really helpful. So a lot of these are kind of intuitive. You think like, yeah, people who are better connected have better health outcomes, right? Um, so take what you already know as educators, as clinicians, and just think about how it would apply to this, 
population. Having pride in oneself and one's identity is a protective factor. Pretty intuitive, right? So thinking like if someone feels good about themselves, they have a high self image, that's gonna have um, a huge impact on their mental health. Internalized transphobia is negative feelings about being transgender. So feeling like someone is a freak or feeling like they themselves are a freak or they don't belong or what's wrong with me, um, that can really contribute to depression, anxiety, as well as sort of negative expectations for rejection. And um, these researchers talk about concealment of identity. Uh, so people thinking, you know, it's not safe for me to come out. I'm not gonna disclose my identity, but I wanna be careful with that because we don't always have to come out. We don't always have to disclose our identity, but, but it can be really stressful if you feel like you have to hide who you are because it's not safe. So not really having a choice or you have to out yourself to make sure that people are using the right pronouns, you're getting access to the care that you, that you need. So that can be really, really stressful. Um, and then of course, gender related discrimination or victimization. So being denied access to housing, education or healthcare based on your identity, um, being victimized based on identity and then being rejected based on identity from family, from friends, from peers. Um, we know that people who are rejected from their family have a higher incidence of, of suicidality, depression and anxiety. And so again, these are things that if anyone experienced discrimination, victimization, we're concerned about risk. So this was just a way to be able to categorize specifically to somebody's gender identity and have a way to talk about it in a way that frames like putting, externalizing the issue. The challenge isn't being trans, like there's nothing wrong with that. The challenge is being trans in a transphobic society. That creates a lot of stress, that creates a lot of angst. Um, so we really want to not pathologize someone's identity. I think that's why I was also hesitant to share a bunch of statistics um, because sometimes that can be taken the other way. Unfortunately, people will use statistics around the high prevalence of suicide as a reason to say like, see, we told you like, you're not stable, you're all kind of crazy. And so we shouldn't support your gender transition. So, so data can be used for, for good or, or for not great intentions, right? Hey, Isaac. Yep. Sorry, I have a question. So yeah. um, someone, um, if you could just maybe share a few examples, I know this is from a few slides ago, but of how to use they, them when talking directly to someone who um, chooses to use those pronouns or who um, those, pronou those pronouns. Um, I think there's just a little confusion um, with they, them specifically. We've got a couple of chats about it. And then yeah. so, um, someone asked about um you know, challenges with minors specifically whose parents or caretakers might not acknowledge their pronouns or um, acknowledge um, acknowledge how they identify. Yeah, these are great, great questions. Thank you. I appreciate that. So going back to the, the question around they, them, theirs pronouns. Um, so there's, so I think when you're talking to somebody directly, it's, you're not going to really be using their pronoun directly, right? Like you're going to be talking to them um, so if you're talking to me, you, you know, you'll say Isaac or, or hi, you know, welcome today. You probably won't be talking about me. So it's more so when, it, when you're talking to like a third party about me, then you would say, hey, I went to this presentation today by this social worker named Isaac. They shared all of this information with us and they were talking about their experiences and, you know, they recommended that we do X, Y, and Z. So it's really going to come into play once you're talking about that individual, but how you would address them directly, you would ask, you know, I just, can I use this name with you? You know, that I think it'd be more important then to, to talk about affirmed names. So if somebody comes in and their um, insurance card or their ID says one name, but they go by a different name, then, you know, making sure that you're using that affirmed name with them. So I didn't actually get my name legally changed until the last year of my master's program. So I had to make sure that I was able to advocate for myself at my school to be addressed and have my affirmed name on the roster and reached out to professors, call me Isaac. Um, this is how I, this is the name that I go by. So I hope, I hope that helps clarify a little bit that pronouns are mostly when you're talking about somebody, but you wanna make sure you're using the right name when talking to somebody. Um, and does they mean uh, the person feels that, it's a great question. Um, so, uh, so, so I think, they, them, theirs can be used a lot of different ways. Somebody who uses they, them, theirs might not identify with one gender or another. So they might not be a man or a woman. 
Um, they might be agender, which is outside of gender. They might be non-binary. Um, ab so absolutely can use they, them, there. Some people do like um, still identify as male or female or, or trans male or trans female, but they feel more comfortable with they, them, their pronouns for, for any reason. So I think, um, I think it's also really important to remember that just because we know somebody's pronouns, we don't necessarily know their gender and vice versa. So we want to still make sure that we're checking in if we, if we need to on intake forms or asking people about their pronouns, like not assuming just because I see somebody in front of me in a suit and a tie and um, said, you know, as a man that they're going to use he, him pronouns or I perceive them to be a man. So we want to ask questions and not make assumptions. But often people who are non-binary or outside of male or female or who's going to use they them but I don't want to say always or that's always the case because I, as soon as I, you say always there's going to be a case where that's not true um, and then the question around how to support um, it's, it's tough with minors when parents aren't supportive so I'm going to I'm going to get to that a little bit towards the end to kind of give tips and tricks but keep that question again and, and, and ask me if I forget but I, I think that's a really good question that will kind of come to in just just a moment um, so talking more about um, trans youth and school safety, I know that this this image is a little bit blurry. Um, hopefully you can see it okay, but I, I wanted to, to grab it from the CDC website because I was really excited that some states are starting to collect the experiences about trans and queer kids on their survey. So if you're from Arizona, you might be familiar with the Arizona Youth Survey. Unfortunately, that survey that collects data around experiences with substance use and mental health and experiences on campus, it doesn't ask about sexual orientation and it doesn't ask about gender outside of only male and female. So we don't know how our trans and queer kids are doing in Arizona on the AYS survey. The YRBSS, the Youth Risk Behavior Surveillance Survey, is a different survey that happens opposite years from AYS that is starting to collect some LGBTQ data, but still not great about it. Not every state is doing it. So this data here comes from the, the 10 states and nine urban school districts that have started collecting that data. So if we're thinking about things that we can also do, please advocate if you're in Arizona to the um, Arizona Criminal Justice Commission to add LGBTQ data questions on that survey so we can get that data. Um, but from those 10 states and those school districts, 2% identified as trans. And from those 2%, 27% felt unsafe at school. 35% were bullied, and then 35% reported a suicide attempt. Um, and it's really hard to gather statistics around suicide because it's not always captured accurately, it's self-reported. So I've seen rates for um, suicide for youth, for, for trans youth, anywhere between 25% and 50%. So, so really considerably high, whereas it's much lower in the general population. Um, so I just, I'm, I'm excited that we're starting to get data so that we can help support youth better. But again, somebody could also take a look at this and say, well, 35%, I told you that they're, they're unstable instead of thinking about like what is contributing to the instability that somebody would consider suicide. Um, so I, I said, I, I guess I lied a little bit. I said no, no statistics, but this is just a, a few. I also share this because GLSEN is the, um, is another organization. They used to go by the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Education Network. I think they're just only going by their acronym, but please, you know, if you know differently, correct me if I'm wrong, but this, these images come directly from your, their website. So you can also use this in presentations. Um, you can use this to advocate at your school or at your organization for more inclusivity and protection and support. So this is nationwide. And this, so GLSEN is doing nationwide surveys. They also, you can download the Arizona fact sheet and look at Arizona specific or whatever state you're in, you can grab that data. 86% felt um, they were harassed or assaulted at school. 84% of trans students felt unsafe at school based on their gender. And then two in five of LGBTQ students of color were bullied or harassed based on their race or ethnicity. So I'm also just presenting like very general information we must also consider that students who sit at the intersection of uh, minority race or ethnicity or uh, English, English isn't their first language um, or have a disability or come from any other marginalized background that this might also be compounded. So we have to also have conversations around privilege and oppression and still think about the experiences of a young white gay man 
in middle class America is going to have a very different experience from a black trans woman from a more urban area and different levels of safety and security. So thinking about that too, um, who's sitting in front of you? How can you support them? What are their challenges or strengths might they have? And how can you take this information and apply it to your work? So if you're working in a school, Glisten is a really, really great resource to advocate for inclusive spaces. So schools that have gender and sexuality alliances or LGBTQ specific clubs, LGBTQ kids have better outcomes. It's like intuitive, right? When they're supported, when they have a place to just be, then they have better outcomes. And if there's any organizations on the school campus, it's um, unconstitutional. You can't deny an LGBTQ uh, organization from also taking place on campus. Like they have that right to have an LGBTQ club. So if you're getting pushed back, if you're having ch challenges, um, thinking about ways to continue advocating in that way, um, and I'll get to at the end too, just more supportive ways to help students on campus. So all that to kind of say, we understand that those risks can lead to increased risk for depression, anxiety, and suicide, can also lead to increased risk for problematic alcohol use, tobacco use, other drugs, and that it can lead to challenges around maintaining safety, high quality housing, healthcare, employment, education opportunities. So again, meeting your client where they are, and also like this isn't gonna be every trans person experience. Not every trans person is gonna be suicidal or, or have depression or be anxious or use drugs or alcohol, things like that. Um, but there might be more at risk based on the experiences that they are having. So as a, as a social worker, um, I think it's really important to think about not only the individual, but kind of the context that we're also sitting in. So some of the challenges that we've been facing, um, again, are, are, are not new. Um, trans folks have been fighting for rights for a long time. Um, if you know about the Stonewall riots in the 19, 1969, um, that's credited by being started by trans women of color, just really having enough of police brutality but even before Stonewall um, in the 1960s in California at Compton's Cafeteria and Cooper's Donuts, there were riots against police because trans people and people who cross-dressed were actually arrested um, because it used to be illegal to wear an article of clothing that didn't match your sex assigned at birth. So, and this isn't that long ago, um, thinking about that being, you know, the situation in our country in the 1960s. Um, so sodomy was still, um, technically against the law until recently. I think in Texas, it's still written on the books. So there's a long history of kind of trying to control people's gender and sexuality and a long, um, a long history of persecution. And unfortunately, that's still still the case. Um, if, you've, if you're in tune to the LGBTQ community, you know that the last four years in particular have been very challenging with challenges to Title IX protection. Uh, we're providing equal access to um, school sports and activities based on gender under Obama included trans people under Trump uh, and DeVos specifically did not include trans people um, with things going back and forth between being banned from the military and being allowed in the military. Um, sort of this back and forth and it also depends on what state you live in and what identity you have, uh, what county you're in. So you can imagine, right? Like, I don't know which way is up. I'm just trying to get through the day. I got to put food on my table and I have to worry about all this other stuff that's happening around me. So if you are interested in policy, LGBTQ map has different maps. You can take a look at the situation in your state. You can also get a picture. Um, the red denotes negative. Orange is like low. Uh, light green is fair, medium, and then high for gender inclusive policy. So it means how inclusive is your state for trans individuals. Um, so because uh, right now, uh, based in I'm Arizona. I want to talk about Arizona specifically. But I saw Cassie unmuted for a second, so I want to stop and pause for questions. Yeah, sorry. Just before we get too yeah. far, did someone ask? You mentioned like the um, school policies with being able to have a you know a club or a group on campus, and someone just wanted to know if that applies to private schools as well, or is that just public? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, I don't want to give you the wrong answer. I think it might only really apply to schools that receive public funding, but Lambda Legal and the ACLU 
would both be really great resources to look up what kind of policies protect trans students um, or even GLSEN. So I would check there to see, you know, what kind of school district you're in, where is your funding? That's also been something, um, going back a slide, actually, I don't think it's gonna be on here, but um, that has also been kind of back and forth with whether or not private or public institutions have the right to include or exclude LGBTQ content or people based on religious um, views or experiences. So that has also been something that's gone, gone back and forth. So I don't, I don't know for sure, but I would check out those websites and I see Cassie popped that in the chat. So thank you. Really great question. Um, so for, for Arizona, um, another way to get involved is just to be aware of what kind of bills are going through um, Arizona right now. So there's a bill that would make it so that state documents um, can only have male or female on your driver's license or any other document. And that's in response to some states are starting to allow an X on a birth certificate or an ID, or I think even the passports might be going that direction. So somebody who isn't male or female has another option as a gender marker. So this is actually moving forward um, in the state. Um, birth certificates as well, only having the option for male or female. Um, and then another one that would prevent licensing bodies from being able to enforce discipline on licensed therapists who carry out specific practices if it aligns with their religious beliefs. So let me back that up a little bit and um, talk about conversion therapy is an attempt to make somebody either straight or cisgender. Um, you might've heard conversion therapy, reparative therapy, or sexual orientation or gender identity change efforts. Um, those, we've been trying to pass bans against those practices across the United States. And some states have been successful in outlawing that, which means that licensed professionals can't carry that out or they'll get disciplined by their, um, like in Arizona, we have the Arizona Behavioral Health Examiner Licensing Board. Um, and so in response to that, right now there's a bill that would prevent the licensing board from disciplinary, from bringing um, disciplinary actions to a clinician if they carried out, for example, conversion therapy. Now this would also apply to a lot of other things, but that's kind of the motivation behind that. So we wanna make sure that the state licensing board can do its job in supporting um, clinicians and providing out ethical, practices because conversion therapy, reparative therapy has actually led to suicide, depression, anxiety. It doesn't work. So not only is it ineffective, you're not going to change somebody to make them not straight or make them or make them straight or make them cisgender. It's going to cause a great deal of harm. And we know that this is harmful. More than 20 national organizations in mental health have condoned it or condemned it. I'm so sorry. That's very different words have condemned it. It's NASW, the American Psychological Association. So we want to make sure that um, the state can't do that. And so again, I'm representing myself as an individual. You also have the right as a private citizen, not on your work time, but as an individual to do research about these bills. And then another thing, a lot of states are seeking to pass um, bills that will prevent specifically trans girls from being able to play in sports. So they're often, last year, this bill was called the Save Women's Sports Act, which meant that you could only play on the team that aligned with your sex assigned at birth. And they were proposing that if there was a question about your gender, that you'd have to undergo an examination to prove that you're really a girl um, or you're really a boy, which is pretty invasive. So that's another kind of trend across the United States. And then um, someone wanted to hear from my dog, there she goes. Um, and then another trend is also to pass bills that would actually either criminally um, punish or, or would fine. So a doctor could actually go to jail or be fined if they provided trans affirming health care to trans youth. So there's lots of bills that are specifically focused on trans individuals right now throughout the United States. And so that's why in Arizona, we have kind of a negative policy tally when it comes to rights for trans individuals. Um, for sexual orientation, it's not negative, but it's not great, which means that lesbian and gay bisexual individuals have more rights so it's pretty low overall. So, you know, if you're from a different state, check out what, what your state looks like um, and you can kind of get a sense for where things are. So I just wanted to give you a quick time check. It's 103, so we have about a half hour left. 
Um, and we had a question come in. So um, we've heard um, a lot about, you know, talking about young people and even adults, um, but they had a question about working with an older um, population. Um, if, you know, some of the supplies or if there's kind of separate information. So it's a, it's a question supporting older adults? Yes. So there's an, um, an LGBTQ organization called SAGE, S-A-G-E, and they specifically focus on, on healthcare and, and mental health and, and rights and access for older adults. So um, I, did, I neglected to include information around older adults in my presentation, unfortunately. So thank you for that reminder um, to not forget our, um, for that population. So SAGE can be really great. Um, just an important thing to say is just to make sure that as folks are, are aging, that they're able to have agency over their body, that um, something that happens a lot is when um, like a, a gay couple goes into a retirement home, sometimes there's, they're split up or they can't be together um, or they're afraid to come, come out if they're trans and they're because they're afraid of, you know, someone else is having to take care of you or help you with very intimate activities, daily, you know, daily living activities. Is that gonna put you in a vulnerable situation? So just making sure that people have access to rights and healthcare. Um, so, so great question, and, and um, if you want to email me separately, I'm happy to connect you with more information. So um, I, I'm really kind of focused on the policy in my work and my research um, because I really want to be aware of the direct mental health impact of, of being a trans person, of trying to navigate work and employment, and then just at every turn, there's sort of this barrier I'm also really concerned about the message that's getting sent to our trans youth when they hear state lawmakers talk about denying them access to sports, um, because it's often said that they're trying to sneak in to hurt somebody or they're not real girls or real women, that they're only gonna, um, it's gonna be unfair if they play sports and then with healthcare, um, people are trying to frame trans affirming healthcare as child abuse and say that this is dangerous. And so I think it really sends a negative message um, and so I, I don't want to necessarily get political, but I just want to share that these are some of the messages that get sent. And this is why I think bills like this are so dangerous. So this, the sponsor of this bill to only have male or female on a state document said last week in a, in a meeting and a hearing for this bill, what's going to happen when someone someday wakes up and they don't want to go to the far extreme and identify as a chicken or something. So here we have a lawmaker comparing being non-binary to being a chicken, to being a farmyard or barnyard animal. And I just think it sends a really clear damaging message if that's something that you're hearing every day, um, even if it's not directly, even if it's not being said to you, just thinking about the mental health impact. And so I think that's why social workers, that's part of our call to really also engage in advocacy because this can be really hard to hear day in and day out. So we wanna make sure that we're staying informed and, and sharing education, um, that that's not actually what's what's happening. So um, uh, yeah, so just, just being mindful that this can send a really negative message to our youth when they know that this is kind of the, the sentiment. Um, all of that to say though, that this isn't a totally negative experience. And when I, um, I've kind of gotten into a tendency when I provide more of these workshops to really kind of focus on the positive but I also wanna make sure that people understand sort of what, what we're up against a lot of the time. But being trans, it doesn't have to be a negative uh, experience all the time for all of the things. So I wanna share a quote about gender euphoria. So gender dysphoria is a feeling of discomfort of being your, your body and your mind not aligning. Um, and that's very real and it can be very painful and very challenging. But I don't think we spend enough time talking about how there can be some joy in the journey and so um, as healthcare providers, I, or as people working in schools or with young people or anyone in the trans population, just also remembering that there can be so much joy in finally having those pieces fit. So this person talks about going into a dressing room for the first time and pulling on clothes that match their identity, um, the feeling of satisfaction or joy or intoxication. They finally knew who they were. Um, they felt a high that they'd never felt before. So I think a lot of the times um, the expectation is that you kind of know who you are because of who you're not. And it has to be like, this is so wrong. This doesn't feel right. I know that I'm not a girl, um, but we don't talk a lot about like when it does fit, um, the feeling of, of, ex of excitement that comes with that, the joy and the journey, the discovery um, that it can be 
it can be a positive thing too. And so this isn't like a toxic positivity thing. That's not where I'm going. But just to say that it, it's also important to recognize that um, there's a congruence and a rightness. And, and I think that's really important. But to get healthcare, we've had to kind of deny that. So to uplift and support trans people, we want to use their chosen name and pronouns. We want to provide positive peer connections, positive community connections, um, provide access to healthcare, and provide safety and protection in public accommodations and coming out. So I want to go through this next section um, a little bit quicker so that we can get to the why you're here, which is like what I can do um, to help support people. So going through transition and coming out. Um, and why language around that matters. So transition can mean a lot of different things for everyone. There can be an internal path of self-discovery, exploration and reflection. There can be a social path where I'm gonna change my name and my pronouns. So when I started coming out at the end of my undergrad experience, I changed my name um, with my friends, but not officially. I was going by different pronouns. I started to dress a little bit differently. Um, some people might undergo medical intervention such as hormones or therapy or um, medical hormone therapy. They might also go through a mental health therapy to get access to those things. Some people might undergo surgery, which kind of colloquially, like we'll call like uh, top surgery and bottom surgery. We don't, when we're talking to each other, don't always use like the medical terms. So you might hear top surgery or bottom surgery. There's also like feminization procedures where people might have uh, reconstructive surgery on their jaw um, or laser hair removal, things like that. And then changing documentation to accurately reflect gender. So if you're working with folks, they might be on any part of this journey. Um, you might be in part, part of that or you might not be. So you might be asked to write a letter to support someone for hormones or surgery. Uh, so I'm happy to talk with you offline about that if you have questions. Um, and so not everyone is gonna have access to this though, or might not want to, they might not be part of their journey. It's also very expensive. A lot of insurances don't cover things. So um, surgery can be anywhere from 10,000 to $125,000 out of pocket on top of the recovery time for some surgeries can be up to six weeks. And often um, it's hard to find a provider in state, which also means like out of state travel, staying in an Airbnb uh, or, a, or a hotel room or something like that. So it can add up very quickly. Um, the National Center for Trans Equality is a great resource to find information about how to help someone change legal documents and find the requirements for a driver's license, a, path, a passport and birth certificate because each of those requires different things. Um, and the birth certificate and the driver's license require different things based on where you live. So again, just kind of another hoop. So you might be asked to help somebody navigate that. When talking about transition, we wanna use words like gender affirmation surgery. Somebody is transitioning. Um, their sex assigned at birth was uh, male, but they are female. They are transgender. Um, so we wanna avoid like sex change. Um, we wanna avoid asking people if they've had the surgery, you know, things like that. Um, it's only necessary to ask about transition if you are a medical provider. Um, or if you think there's a legitimate mental health reason to be asking about it. Um, so that's gonna take some finessing. And then I just have some additional, like we don't wanna call people um, transgenders, like look, there's a group of transgenders, like no, like a group of trans people, transgender is an adjective. So keeping on that side, like how can I, you know, how can I support you in your gender journey? Um, you know, are you here? We don't want to assume that people are there for support around their transition, but they might be. So then you might ask, like, tell me about your journey so far. You know, what's in your, you know, what are you planning? Are you, do you want to access surgery? Do you want to access hormones? Do you want a support group? So you kind of open-ended questions or how, how can I support you sort of things. Um, and then just remembering that, like, that coming out process um, through that journey, it's not like a one time. So I'm, you know, I'm going to, come out once with my family and then that's it. So I just kind of created this, um, you know, you're coming out at home in the community, at school and at work, and I'm sure I'm missing places, just to show that it's an ongoing process. So um, I've come out in this presentation today. Um, students might have to come out on their IEPs um, or it might be in their records, right? Or if somebody is institutionalized, then their gender might come out again. So it might not always be like a, 
a voluntary outing, it might be that they're forced to be outed. I'm thinking about if old family photos are up at your family home and then you bring a new partner home and like, do you wanna share those photos? Are you comfortable? So even if they're, you know, you're already out to your partner, just navigating that. Um, something as simple as meeting new people and answering questions about childhood. Um, so uh, it's Girl Scout cookie time, right? And so people have asked if I'm, I was a Boy Scout, I was actually um, a daisy and a brownie, but then I have to explain a lot if I say that I once was in the Girl Scouts, right? So um, it's kind of this continued navigation in this, is it safe? Is it not safe? When do I want to come out? Is this the time? Do I just say, no, I wasn't in Boy Scouts and leave it at that? Um, so just to think about how to support clients that there's going to be different times when people are going to be coming out. So Isaac, we had a question come through yeah. about, um, you know, I'm thinking of like our setting specifically in Aurora where we have um, like a rooming situation. Um, if there's like a transgender or non-binary individual, is it a best practice to put them in their own room, um, to put them, you know, uh, in a room where they identify? What's kind of a best practice for providing that type of care in this type of setting? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. It comes up a lot, especially when there's like overnight or inpatient settings. So um, th like first, I think, you know, think about the mental health of the person. And if somebody is in a setting and they are isolated in their own room at the end of the hallway, wherein everyone else is bitied up or has a roommate um, or is in a more communal living space, like what kind of message is that sending that you need to be on your own? Why are, you know, are people gonna question why you're in your own space? Um, is that really what's best for you? So I think sometimes we go to the idea like we need to isolate you to protect you, but then think about what is that disconnection actually doing? Is that really helping you or is that hurting you? Um, the other side of that is somebody might not be comfortable in a communal space yet. So if you can, if there's a, the opportunity to talk with your, the client and see where they would feel most comfortable because there's gonna be pros and cons on either side. Um, so we don't want to send the message you're not really a man so you can't be in the men's room you're not really a woman you can't be in the women's room and then how many of our settings have places for non-binary folks so i think it's about having that trust and communication with your client to see what would be best to them and providing as much of an option as possible um, in settings we are often worried that other clients will have negative reactions um, to that trans client but one if they're not out they don't need to know that that, that client is trans. And if they choose to share that they are trans with the other clients, often it's the providers that have a bigger problem than the other clients. The other clients just wanna know like, cool, like what's your name? And like, what's your, why are you, you know, why are you here? And can we connect in their gender is usually like less of an issue. I think that the clients often, or the providers often impose that on the clients. So I know that's kind of hard to, that's not a great answer, right? It depends, but check with your client first. And then, and then kind of go from there. No, that's great. Thank you. And um, we do have some more questions about, um, you know, advice about, you know, coming out or, you know, potential gender fluidity and how something might change in the future and how that might affect someone would, how someone would identify. But I want to make sure that we can get through your content first. So just yeah. putting your radar and we can discuss that after but want to make sure everyone knows that I'm keeping an eye on it but we want we have limited time so I want to make sure we cover your content and then we can do questions after yeah oh, well, I don't want to get to your questions I think they're really important so I'm um I'll come back I'll come back to these questions for sure okay. I'll, I'll provide a couple of tips and tricks and then come back to kind of these these are good I'm but just okay, keep good. okay. yeah um, I just see one question about yeah but the fluidity right so at any any point in your coming out journey um, your gender can be just as fluid through this time. So that's another time to like come out. Like I came out once as queer and female in high school, then coming out all over again as trans, masculine, non-binary, still queer as an adult. And then other people's um, sexuality shift over time where some people might've been attracted to one gender um, pre-transition and then through transition realized that they may be attracted to multiple genders, but that didn't come up for them because they were so focused on their gender at the time. So these things are kind of ever evolving. So I think this is also an interesting place to talk about that because then you might have to come back around and have like a second or third coming out in each of these situations. So it can absolutely be ever evolving and ever fluid. Or even just finding a new term, like that terms list um, 
that I shared at the beginning, you might identify one way, but then you find like that term that fits you better. And you're like, yes, like I'm actually, this is who I am. So I think a lot of things can influence that fluidity over time. So sort of the affirming approaches, um, just really quickly thinking about where you, I think the first place to start is your, is thinking about our own biases. So there's a kind of a range of acceptance from repulsion all the way up to nurturing. And this is a, a Dorothy Riddle scale from the 90s, but I think it's relevant just to show that when we talk about acceptance, it's actually considered on the negative side with repulsion, pity, tolerance, and acceptance. And where we wanna move as a society is to support admiration, appreciation, and nurturing. So we've been thinking about building rapport. If we talk about like tolerance in the workplace of um, our LGBTQ coworkers or we tolerate LGBTQ clients, like we, we tolerate a toothache. Well, I, I'm gonna tolerate that pebble in my shoe until I can get to a place where I can dump out the, the pebble in my shoe. That's not really a way to think about somebody you're working with, right? Or I accept, even acceptance is kind of like, uh, uh, you know, kind of on the border because people have said like, I accept, I accept you, um, but I don't accept your lifestyle or my religion tells me I can't accept your choices, but I still love you. And that even that, like, I can't be my full self with you potentially. So I just want to show like, we want to move to a place of really nurturing and appreciating people for, for who they are. Um, and so then the other important thing to think about is like, am I asking this question because I am personally curious or is this clinically relevant? Um, do I need to know about your surgery status because I, I'm a doctor and I need to know kind of what body parts you have? Um, am I wondering about your transition because it's gonna help you know, in this clinical interview? Because as a client, the client is always asking, is it safe to disclose or is my safety going to be compromised? So if I go to urgent care for bronchitis, do I need to tell them I'm trans? Like we all have lungs, is that necessary at that time? Um, or if I'm coming to you for long-term therapy, is that what I need to disclose? Who, who I am. And so we wanna make sure that we're being straightforward and supportive of our clients at all times. Um, and we wanna avoid some pitfalls, um, like what's your, what's your real name? Um, I never would have guessed you were trans, like oh, you don't look trans. Um, have you had the surgery yet? Are you sure? Are you really a boy or a girl? You're so, you know, telling someone they're so brave or asking if it's a phase. These are all kinds of different microaggressions that um, I have personally heard. My, some of my friends have heard. We all have kind of horror stories about um, going to mental health or physical health provider. Um, I had a friend that really was turned away for bronchitis um, because the doctor didn't know how to treat him. And again, we all have lungs. So um, just being aware that we might have these things, we might say some of them out of a place of good intent you know, you're so brave, or I never would have guessed, we might think that that's a compliment. But what we're saying is like, um, I expect trans people to look a certain way and you didn't meet that stereotype that I had in my head. Um, and I, I'm, you know, happy again to, to provide more information around some of that. On intake forms, making sure that we have the correct name and pronouns. Um, on the intake form, a place for somebody to list, you might need to collect their gender, that matches their insurance so that you can bill appropriately. But then you might also have a multi-step question that asks about their sex assigned at birth and then their gender. Um, so that way you can ask if they're trans, if that's appropriate or asking just an open-ended question, what is your gender? There's also a question to say, uh, you can also ask it as, um, what is your gender and offer up a select all that apply, just making sure you have multiple options. So it is okay to ask these questions and it actually signals to your clients that you're paying attention when you do ask them. So it's not that it's bad to ask about sexuality and gender. We just wanna be mindful about how, how we're doing it. And I know that there was a question from the survey about, um, you know, sometimes you, you do have to know Ask, you have to ask about an intake form around like surgical status because maybe you're in an integrated health setting or you are in a doctor's office. So instead of asking in a very pointed way, like for, you know, on an intake form, for women only, when was your last period? Just take out the for women only part, right? And just say, when was your last period? Um, even at, at doctor's offices, like they're gonna, they still designate if this is for a male or a female. But if you just list anything and the person, if it doesn't apply to them, they skip it. If it does apply to them, 
they might check it off or write it in. So often we have to think like, is it really the gender that we're worried about or is it the body part? And the rule of thumb is if you have the body part, get it checked. So some trans women, you know, um, needing prostate exams or um, some trans men still needing gynecological care. So you might have, you know, might ask questions so that you can make appropriate referrals. So just take the gender out of it and just have all options on an intake form and kind of present it that way. Um, and so again, just like making wherever you can affirm someone's pronouns. So at, at a school, being able to have chosen name and pronouns on the roster. Um, this has been an, a big issue for online platforms with Zoom right now, right? And we didn't even touch on like how COVID has impacted the LGBTQ community, but um, work with your IT department and your school so that when a, a student is logging in, that they're logging in with their affirmed name, their chosen name, instead of their name. There, someone I saw in the chat said dead name. And some people do use that term. Like my dead name is don't call me that, don't use that for me. I don't, I'm just gonna disassociate. I'm not gonna do well in your class. I'm probably gonna skip school. Um, so making sure that, you know, kind of covering all of the bases there. Um, so I know we have like a only a few minutes left now. So I do wanna, I do wanna take your questions. And so I know it, um, I think I will, I will end up providing the, the PowerPoint if that's helpful because there's content that we didn't cover. So I do wanna to get to some more of your questions now as we kind of wrap up. Um, I just have kind of an, just one more example where Vanessa started seeing a new therapist. The therapist already knows Vanessa's pronouns from the inclusive intake form and the phone screening earlier. And when she comes in, the therapist affirms her identity and uses open-ended questions to avoid assumptions. Um, we don't assume that Vanessa is in today because she's a trans woman struggling with suicidality. Um, Vanessa actually comes with us because she just broke up with her boyfriend and she's having a hard time adjusting, right? We don't want to assume, we don't always know. Um, so tell me about your situation. What brings you in today? Um, instead of asking, do you have a boyfriend or do you have a girlfriend? Do you have any romantic partners, right? So I think it's, it's the skills we already have, but we're just applying um, a trans and queer lens to those skills and just opening it up. Uh, so that was my, uh, the resources you'll get. So that was kind of the last slide. I'm sorry that I rushed through that. This is my contact information. So you can continue to reach out, but I'd love to answer any last questions or things that I kind of like flew over. Um, so I'm just gonna peek at the chat. Um, or Cassie, is there are other questions that I oh, missed? Oh, no, um, we've had some coming in and I think you answered some of them um, kind of in the last few slides. If you wanna take a look and see what kind of pops up, feel free, you'll, you'll be able to, then I can communicate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so if someone asked, in the comprehensive assessment I complete with all patients, would it be better to go ahead and ask the question um, with the option to, to answer or pass on their answer. So I think when, when we're collecting um, sexual orientation and gender identity data, we kind of are, we're afraid that we're gonna offend clients. And I'm, I'm not saying this is what you're saying, but um, we're, afraid, we're afraid to ask the question because we're uncomfortable with it. And so think about all the other questions we're asking that day, probably around drug use, substance use, child abuse, like any of these things. So it's really about how we ask. So, hey, I'd love to know more information about you. I'm gonna ask you a few questions. As with any of the questions, you can pass if you're not comfortable or you can share. And so I think if we give them a, on a specific question, if we say, you don't have to answer this question about your gender, sometimes that can set up the idea that this is the question that's uncomfortable, so I don't actually want to know. So I would just kind of put that disclaimer at the beginning. And then um, there's different resources on how to ask it appropriately. So you can like figure out how to work that into your um, an intake, but it can just be like, okay, what was your sex assigned at birth? And let them answer, How, what is your gender? So that if they say, if, you know, if it matches, you know, their cisgender, but if it doesn't match um, and they provide a different gender than assigned at birth, then you know that you might know that they're transgender. So you could say, okay, do you consider yourself transgender or what would be the term to use? So I would definitely ask um, that, ask that question of everyone that comes in because um, we kind of get into the habit too of only asking the people that we think might be LGBTQ. Um, similar question around preferred pronouns. Yes, so the term the, the term is gender pronoun or just 
pronoun. It used to be PGP or preferred pronoun. So now what I tell people is um, we don't prefer to be respected, right? I don't just like kind of prefer that maybe you use this. I expect it because I deserve respect. So definitely um, pronoun or gender pronoun. And um, it will include the resources and the and it will include the presentation. Also, if it's important to you for CEU purposes, this should count as your as 1.5 of your cultural diversity. Um, I know those can sometimes be hard to get. Um, see if I missed any. Um, uh, so, so there was a question that I want to come back to. I didn't answer the question about supporting a minor. Oh, you just asked again. Great. So I think um, it's really important that you work with the, the child to or the minor to kind of figure out how, if, you know, sorry, let me back up. I think it's really important to affirm their identity. So if they're in session with you asking what is your asserted name and pronouns and honoring that, and then talking with them when we talk to your parents, do you want me to use this name and pronouns or is it better for you that I don't? And consider the age of the child, if they're, especially if they're a teen, building that therapeutic rapport and alliance. If they're a little bit younger, I know sometimes it can be a little bit trickier because the parents want to know everything is said in session. But continue to work with the parents around coming around. There are support groups. Arizona Trans Youth and Parent Organization is a great one. GLSEN, um, PFLAG has our trans loved ones. So, you know, talking with the parents about Again, the joy in the journey, I think parents are also scared. They're like, my child is gonna have a miserable life for all the reasons that I shared today. Um, but really talking about the joy of the journey and the, the importance of alignment and talking with the youth about how to best support them, um, again, in a developmentally appropriate way. So I, I think it's really important to build that alliance with, with, your, with your client and support their name and pronouns because then it's just like one more place that they don't have that. Um, and there was a study I didn't mention earlier that showed that when trans youth can use their chosen name in at least one arena in their life, that's either school, home, community, that their suicide risk goes down. So even just like sharing, like there's, there's something so great about just being able to be in alignment with their identity. Um, and I think that maybe is a nice note to end on. Um, I, sorry if I didn't get to your questions, please follow up and email me. Um, connect with me. I provided my Gmail because my ASU address likes to block um, domains it doesn't recognize. So um, e email, Twitter, LinkedIn. Um, and I really appreciate your time and your questions. And I love that you all are here and want to support your clients. So thank you, Aurora, for this space. Um, I really appreciate the time to talk with you all and um, hope that we can connect soon. Well, thank you again, Isaac. I mean, I, we are so grateful to have you and this is such a wonderful presentation. It, I, I don't think I'm alone in saying that, you know, we'd almost love to have you do more of these just to <laughs> really get in front of folks. Um, and clearly just with the chat alone, I mean, everyone's putting this was incredibly helpful. There was a lot of really great questions that have come through. Uh, folks, if you do have questions that uh, have not been answered yet or anything like that, again, his contact information is there. Please, you know, reach out. I'm going to encourage that. Um, in addition to that, thank you for being here today. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and stop our recording now.